record. Good evening, you're all very welcome to this month's LGBT History Club. LGBT History Club is a joint venture between the LGBT Heritage Project, of which I'm the coordinator, I'm Richard O'Leary, and we run the club in conjunction with the Linden Hall Library. And uh, we've been doing this since last um, uh, July. Uh, and uh, we have been doing it online because we've never actually been able to meet in person in the Linden Hall Library in Belfast. However, um, one of the advantages of that is that we're able to have um, an audience um, from far and wide. And uh, also we record the talks so that uh, you can listen to them afterwards. We put them up on the YouTube channel of the Lynn Hall Library. And you can also keep track of the LGBT Heritage Project and the History Club on our social media, which is at LGBT History NI. I'm delighted to be able to welcome tonight's speaker, who is Abigail Fletcher. And Abigail will be talking on the subject of cross-border LGBT activism in Ireland, 1977 to 1999. Um, Abigail um, is a PhD student at University of Edinburgh in history, and her PhD thesis is called Homosexuality in Northern Ireland, 1921 to 1982. Uh, and um, we're all looking forward to hearing that work on a future occasion because tonight um, I've, I've asked Abigail to, to talk on some work which you did as an undergraduate student um, on cross-border LGBT activism uh, because I think this is a topic that um, is I mean, there's not enough work done in it, but also because we have an audience, which I know is from across Ireland, North and South, I think we'll have some great questions um, later on. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Abigail Fletcher. Abigail. Thank you very much, Richard. I'll just share my screen. Um, make sure you can all see. Can everyone see the PowerPoint okay? Yes. Yep. yes. Fabulous, right, I'll set off then. So good evening and thanks to Richard and the Lennon Hall Library for the opportunity to speak to you all and to so many of you um, for attending. For those of you who don't know me, um, and as Richard mentioned, my name is Abigail Fletcher and I'm a first year PhD researcher here at the University of Edinburgh, where my thesis looks at homosexual law reform in Northern Ireland from partition in 1921 to decriminalisation in 1982. I'll be very happy to answer any questions you have about that project during our discussion, um, but the talk I am about to present to you, as Richard mentioned, is based on my undergraduate dissertation at the University of Oxford, where I studied, okay, um, where I studied LGBT activism after 1982 under the very generous supervision of Professor Jean Pooley. It was in the summer of 2018 that I first became interested in the history of LGBT activism in Northern Ireland, and I'm very excited to share some of those findings with you this evening. In a 1980 letter to Tony Walsh, a Dublin-based activist who established the Irish Queer Archive, Doug Sobey, a founding member of the Gay Liberation Society in Belfast, parenthetically suggested, you'd think we were more than just 100 miles apart. Despite their geographical proximity and cultural similarities, Sobey's admission indicates a profound sense of distance between LGBT activists in Northern Ireland and their counterparts in the Republic. The reality is that LGBT activists on both sides of the Irish border relied heavily on the connections they established throughout the island and beyond, developing associations that would prove instrumental to their activity in the late 20th century. This paper will test the assumption that LGBT activism in Northern Ireland was constrained and defined by national borders to argue that external partnerships, influences and frameworks were an inherent characteristic of the struggle to achieve gay rights. As a product of partition, LGBT activists on both sides of the Irish border had to duplicate their efforts in order to affect change in two disparate legislative systems. Close examination of activist records contained in the Irish Queer Archive in Dublin suggests that Northern Ireland might be located in patterns of global and European change, whilst closer to home, the friendships, camaraderie and council that developed between activists in Dublin and Belfast forged community and affected change that has been hitherto disregarded in histories of both countries. 
As I mentioned, I first became interested in the Irish cross-border effort for LGBT rights when conducting research for my undergraduate dissertation. This collaboration is a useful site of historical analysis as it pervades the very origins of LGBT activism on both sides of the Irish border. In his excellent work on gay and lesbian activism in the Republic of Ireland, Patrick McDonough foregrounds the impact of events in Northern Ireland as an ever-present theme, especially with regards to prevalent discourses on human rights that reverberated south of the border. In fact, the Irish gay rights movement was founded as a direct result of cross-border interactions with the Belfast Gay Liberation Society and sexual reform movement. Thus, I would argue, we cannot understand LGBT activism in either region without recognizance of their shared genesis, sustained connections, and synergetic achievements. This is perhaps most salient in the comparable decriminalization narratives in both countries, both of which sought to reverse Victorian British sodomy laws through an appeal to the European Court of Human Rights, accomplished by Jeff Dudgeon in Northern Ireland in 1982, whose crusade was later replicated for the Republic by Senator David Norris in 1993. LGBT activists in Ireland, North and South were also faced with a religiously determined moral conservatism in a manner more fundamentalist than many of their neighbors in the rest of the UK and Europe. This had serious implications for LGBT people in Northern Ireland. In November 1979, Tony Walsh expressed his concern that the extension of the Sexual Offences Act 1967 to Northern Ireland, which authorised male same-sex sexual relations in England and Wales, would be obstructed by the vocalism of an extremist minority. Such fear was well grounded as the Democratic Unionist Party coordinated a Save Ulster from Sodomy campaign in the 1970s that attracted 70,000 signatures, reflecting approximately 5% of the Northern Ireland population. Though polarised, sexual attitudes across Catholic and Protestant devotional cultures were consistent in their conservatism. And such viewpoints have persisted into the 21st century, with more recent vocalisation by former DUP MP Iris Robinson in inflammatory comments that relate sodomy to the sexual abuse of children and through the high profile Ashes Bakery discrimination case. Such perspectives were largely mirrored south of the border Though here the unique moral outlook of the nation is often explained in terms of the pronounced mastery of the Catholic Church. Tom Inglis and Dermot Fact have critically profiled Ireland's complex sexual attitudes, aptly highlighting the consistency of standards across the border. Of course, religious opposition to homosexuality is not unique to the island of Ireland, but what both regions share is a culture where conceptualizations of nationhood have long been underscored by Christianity so that homosexuality represented a threat to both communities. This characteristic centrality of religion to national identity goes some way to explaining why attitudes towards homosexuality have been so consistent in their intolerance whilst facilitating cross-border comparison when we come to consider those activists who sought to challenge this context. It's also worth remembering that this ongoing hostility towards the LGBT community operated within the context of the Northern Ireland Troubles. This had an adverse effect on a minority already acutely targeted by the police and security forces, with one interviewee in Duggan's study highlighting that people were getting shot and tortured and still the police found time to harass gay people. And I would urge anyone who's interested in, um, in LGBT history during this period to read the book on the, the screen because it's a very, um, very interesting um, catalogue of life history interviews from LGBT people during the same period. Widespread civil disorder during this period also had the effect of reducing political attention on minority rights issues. As Secretary of State Roy Mason said of the matter of homosexual law reform in 1976, I cannot say that this is the most important problem in their minds. LGBT activists responded to the exceptional intolerance of this context through the construction of an alternative sexual world as a counter to sectarian identity politics. Jeff Dudgeon has gone so far to, as to argue that in a province where religious differences divide most of the community, the gay scene has never been sectarian. There isn't time within the scope of this paper to fully unpack this claim, but I will elaborate on reconciliation programs, such as Gay Christian Fellowship, which use their religious profile to embrace both cross-confessional and cross-border principles. Studying Irish LGBT activism in this cross-border perspective also makes sense as the literature on the Republic is much more developed. Those scholars, including myself, are making an effort to concentrate on issues and attitudes north of the border. 
The 2015 equal marriage referendum stimulated a further increment in research as historians sought to account for the transformation of the predominantly Catholic Irish society of Inglis and Farrett's portraits to a beacon of equality and liberty to the rest of the world, in the words of Leo Varadkar, Ireland's first openly gay Taoiseach and cabinet minister. Recent work by Patrick McDonough, Maurice Casey, Anne Nolan, Orla Egan and Porat Kerrigan, to name but a few, have considered issues ranging from universities to the media, amounting to a dynamic field of LGBT histories of Ireland. This historiographical imbalance, alongside the pertinent similarities in the histories between hom homosexuality north and south of the Irish border, made this cross-border comparison and collaboration a natural starting point for my undergraduate research. Studies of LGBT activism in Ireland also benefit from the historical consciousness of, the, of this community and the great work being done by LGBT Heritage NI and all of its volunteers is a real testament to this. In June 2008, the Irish Queer Archive was accepted to the National Library of Ireland in Dublin, affirming LGBT history as an essential part of the story of the Irish nation. This was produced and preserved by movement veterans and includes historical and cultural materials such as press clippings, letters, and organizational files. These counter the fragmentary nature of much of LGBT history, which often relies on criminal records and institutional reactions to homosexuality. Rather, these sources permit greater access to the activity and mentality of LGBT activists, how they perceived the society they inhabited themselves and each other. This paper has used IQA material relating to the National Gay Federation's interaction with organisations in Northern Ireland, including annual reports, official letters and press releases. So I'm going to give you a bit of a profile of the groups I'm going to talk about this evening, um, many of which will probably be familiar to you from other talks. Um, so LGBT activism in Northern Ireland stemmed from the Gay Liberation Society at QUB, which was established in 1971. The early 1970s also saw the foundation of Cara Friend, a voluntary befriending and information organisation for homosexual and bisexual men and women. This offered social support and integration, as well as targeted services for transvestites, transsexuals and lesbians. The Northern Ireland Gay Rights Association, or NIGRA, was the driving force of the decriminalisation of homosexuality in the early 1980s. Gay Christian Fellowship, or the NICRH, was a collection of gay men from a variety of religious backgrounds, mostly Christian, who met regularly in a comfortable, relaxed atmosphere of fellowship. Established in the 1980s, its southern counterpart was the comparably larger and more developed REACH. In the Republic, NGF worked towards the achievement of equal rights and status for gay men and lesbians, organising social events, publishing a monthly newspaper, and liaising with other gay groups. This is arguably the most mature of the organisations that I'll profile in this paper with a developed bureaucratic structure, a disco and a dedicated base at the Hirschfeld Centre. NGF split from the earlier Irish gay rights movement because of personal animosities and the latter focused on the legislative campaign for the decriminalisation of homosexuality, which was led by David Norris. This paper will cover the years 1977 to 1999. Um, this is an important period of gay activity and in the development of relationships between activists in Dublin and Belfast. The sources I've examined here follow a total of seven NIGRA NGF exchanges, two between Cara Friend and NGF, and two exchanges between Gay Christian Fellowship and REACH. It's very probable that more exchanges took place during these years that are not included in these sources, especially as NIGRA was making an annual visit to Dublin by 1980. I should also highlight that the start date for this paper is an arbitrary one, taken from the IQA sources that I've examined, as cross-border links clearly predated 1977 and continued long, long after. Before I expound how these particular cross-border relationships played out in practice, it's important to highlight that LGBT organisations in Northern Ireland habitually appealed to and benefited from allies and resources outside of their domestic milieu. This was both rhetorical and practical. The 1978 to 79 annual report for Cara Friend, which you can see on the screen, thanks the Dutch based Spartacus International Gay Guide for a £250 donation, which was used to purchase full carpeting for their four university street premises. The same report, written within the context of the ongoing Save Us from Bodomy campaign, criticised the Secretary of State Humphrey Atkins for discontinuing promised homosexual law reform in Northern Ireland, published as a draft order in council in July 1979. 
In their criticism of church influence on the law, the authors declare Northern Ireland a theocratic state, noting the Ayatollahs in Iran could not have asked for more influence. This reference to the 1979 Iranian revolution is customary of much of the rhetoric of LGBT activists in Northern Ireland during this time. He sought out international examples to accent the atypical extremity of religious influence on the state. The eventual decriminalization of homosexuality in Northern Ireland was in fact accomplished by these multiple transnational entanglements. In this instance, Europe's status as a guarantor of LGBT rights was effectively deployed to yield change. In 1981, a Belfast shipping clerk, Jeff Dudgeon, successfully contested the legality of gay criminality in Northern Ireland at the European Court of Human Rights, circumventing both the devolved parliament at Stormont and central parliamentary authority at London during a time when direct rule was in place. The Dudgeon case was the first at Strasbourg to rule in favour of gay rights and set a precedent for the Council of Europe that mandated tolerance across member states. This would be emulated by the Republic of Cyprus in 1993 which, like Northern Ireland, inherited British sodomy laws and was impeded by domestic factors such as strong state church influence and social conservatism. The same outward looking perspective and European legal framework was mobilized by the Norris campaign, which also achieved decriminalization through Strasbourg in 1993. Also in the 1980s, the Republican Gays Against Imperialism used an all island profile in their advocacy of an interrelation between national and gay liberation. Though short-lived, GAI, GAI members, including Cathal Kerrigan and Tullock McNallis, embraced Republican and internationalist vocabulary to locate their efforts in a wider struggle beyond LGBT activism. Morris Casey has eloquently profiled how these competing motivations were negotiated, as well as recognising the transnational strategies deployed by this organisation through speaking tours of Irish America and the pursuit of European allies. Likewise, last month, um, Tarlick Brothers spoke at Derry's Outing the Past Festival of LGBT History and a tribute that recognised his involvement in LGBT protests across Ireland and the US. Having briefly considered these myriad external strategies and sponsors, I'll now specifically investigate the relationship between LGBT activists north and south of the Irish border. These affinities and alliances, again, took the rhetorical form of letters and principles but they were also practically attested by numerous talks, demonstrations, parties and gap togethers that bridge division and lay a foundation for change in both societies. I'll de detail three distinct phases of collaboration before considering some of the disparities in this record, which I hope to rely on the expertise of many of you in attendance this evening to unpack further during our discussion. As I've already explained, the 1970s saw the foundation of many LGBT groups in Ireland which embraced a cross-border profile and perspective from their outset. In 1974, a symposium on homosexuality at Trinity College Dublin was described as the big coming out event in Irish sexual history by Jeff Dudgeon. Another conference on sexuality, this time held at QUB in 1977, was addressed by Irish activist and founder of the Irish LGBT Oral History Project, Edmund Lynch, who denounced Mr. Paisley and his cohorts alongside his like kind in the Republic. Thus, we can see that during this decade, universities were an important site of transnational mobility, where LGBT activists and individuals across Ireland, and indeed the rest of the UK, came together to contest the intolerance of their environments. The 1980s were the most concentrated phase of collaboration, I'll summarise in this paper. This decade saw developing familiarity and friendship through regular exchanges between groups based in Dublin and Belfast. In January 1980, Jeff Dudgeon wrote to David Norris and Edmund Lynch to organise plans for Nigra's annual trip to Dublin the following month. He described this unfamiliarly as a tour of inspection, during which eight male attendees travelled to the Irish capital, requesting special status for Nigra delegates, as well as free entry to discos, as a means of strengthening our friendship and our organisations. May 1980 witnessed the first national gay conference to be held in Northern Ireland, the Friend National Conference, described in a broad invitation by Doug Sobey of Cara Friend as an event of considerable significance for us. Delegates attended from various locations across the UK and Ireland, and Sobey's letters to publish the event in the Republic are replete with collective nouns that further construct this sense of a shared community between the two groups. Things were not always plain sailing, though. 
In September 1980, NI activist Ray Kavanagh wrote to David Norris to discuss mutually destructive antagonisms between NGF and the Irish gay rights movement. Kavanagh references the personalities involved, providing some insight as to the nature of this, di this dispute. He offers assistance to the restoration of good relations between the two organisations, which became divided because of a prioritisation of social amenities to the community over the legislative campaign for decriminalisation. It's unclear how much of a hand their colleagues north of the border had in resolving these differences, but the fact that they were writing to offer their help demonstrates how both parties were invested in their mutual success. This year also saw Bernard Kyo writing to Jeff Dudgeon about Cardinal O'Fee's opposition to homosexual law reform in Northern Ireland, which prompted NGF to take to the Irish Times to accuse the Catholic Church of engaging in diplomatic intrigue with the British government. Such advocacy is indicative of the comradeship between activists on both sides of the border, especially as Catholic standpoints have consequences for the LGBT communities in both jurisdictions. At this stage, it's clear that Northern groups were content to defer to the maturity of their friends in the Republic, though of course they would precede them in terms of gay law reform. In December 1980, Dudgeon, whilst expressing strong personal opinions about his opposition to the death penalty, encourages NGF and IGRM to make a public statement about the matter that Nigra might endorse. He later appeals to Bernard Kyo for information about John Porter and the Galway Gay Collective, designating perhaps greater enlightenment and contacts south of the border. Nigra Secretary Sean McGoran even wrote to Tony Walsh, describing having been told that he was the one to suck up to, to have his magazine sold in the Hirschfield Centre. However, by June 1981, the Belfast groups were able to invite their friends to the Carpenter Club, a gay disco venue named after the socialist poet and gay rights advocate Edward Carpenter. Writing, writing to Bernard Cure again, Jeff Dudden suggested an arrangement whereby production of Carpenter Club cards and Hirschfield cards might permit holders to gain admission at either venue at standard member rates, proposing an equivalence between the two organisations to encourage reciprocal attendance of these discos. Yet again, Belfast activists relied on the experience of NGF seeking advice and instructive examples. In September 1982, Dudgeon depended on NGF's experience of running Flickers nightclub, asking for specifications of their disco floor and inquiring as to their policy of punishment of members and customers in order to apply these to the Carpenter Club in Belfast. In 1983, the All-Ireland Lesbian and Gay Men Conference recurrently solidified this union of the LGBT community across the island. Previous gatherings had taken place first at Cork in 1981 and in Dublin the following year. Writing to his southern counterparts in May 1983, Gabriel Burns trusted in the sophistication of the NGF publicity framework and finances to advertise the conference to the gay community in the Republic. The conference poster noted how previous iterations had invigorated the growth of gay collectives at Dublin and Cork with an implicit desire to stimulate comparable expansion in Northern Ireland. Again, the use of collective nouns and language is really highly important. You can see here on the screen that the author writes, last year we had the Charles Self, Charles Self murder, sorry. This year we have had two more gay killings and the results in controversial court sentences. The 1983 conference reflected observations from the previous year regarding the limits of national organizations in terms of their public impact, which might be cited as further explanation for why this cross-border effort was so important to LGBT activists in Ireland. Although in 1984, Sean McGoran described the previous year's conference as a relatively pleasant event, Jeff Dudgeon suggested that the at Hirschfield during a 1983 visit. Though customary by this stage, Dudgeon still encourages NGF to travel to Belfast if desired, suggesting that requited visits were in need of some incitement. The February 1984 NGF Nigra exchange in Dublin saw the Belfast group accommodated in French houses, as well as participating in the filming of a half hour television program together. The advisory dynamic between Irish and Northern Irish LGBT activists appears to shift in an April 1985 letter from Sean McGoran to Joe Manifold, a 
a member of Tell a Friend, which was like our friend in the Republic. Here, McGoran advises Manifold about the sources of funding already obtained for Nigra and Cara Friend, suggesting that their friends south of the border contact the National Social Services Board, as well as highlighting potential sources of funding for Hirschfeld Enterprises and Out Magazine. Thus, we can see that both groups had advice to offer one another, and this consultative apparatus benefited all parties as they navigated similar contexts. The third and final phase of cross-border collaboration between Irish LGBT activists, I will examine here, concerns groups with a religious profile, namely Gay Christian Fellowship and REACH. Of course, I should mention that one of these organisers was Richard O'Leary, who's spoken about gay Christian activism across Ireland at QUB in October 2019 in a very entertaining talk. So if you're interested in anything I'm mentioning here, I, I, would, I would thoroughly recommend that one to you because it's available online. These organisations engaged in joint holiday weekends from the 1980s. The programme for one such event in September 1990 included hymns, compline, intercessions, morning prayer and Eucharist, as well as poetry and Bible readings. One poem which you can read on the slide here, Tomorrow But Not Today, potently captures the alienation of gay men in the Christian churches. And these events offered such isolated figures a sense of community that was lacking amongst their de denominational brethren. Although informal socialisation certainly characterised the interactions between LGBT groups north and south of the Irish border by the last decade of the 20th century, this was bolstered by Cooperation North, a non-political organisation established in 1979 to enable people from both areas to make contact and work together through project-based exchange programmes. In practice, this involved twinning groups of similar interests and facilitating cross-border exchanges through financial support. LGBT collaboration in Ireland clearly predated such structural incentives, though Cooperation North sponsored several exchanges between NIGRA and NGF, Gay Christian Fellowship and REACH. This perhaps marked a shift from the informal hotel recommendations exchanged or hospitality offered in each other's homes, as was the case in the early 1980s. In September 1990, Colm O'Boyle, then GCF chair, chronicled a recent exchange with REACH. He discussed expectations that their Dublin trip would both enrich and invigorate us, especially as the Belfast contingent was, comparably, was a comparably smaller group. He described how the exchange itself facilitated lively discussion on the implications of being both gay and Christian, especially in the Irish setting where the more conservative religious tenets are so fervently espoused. O'Boyle described the Sunday Eucharist as a very warm and joyful service where everyone could feel accepted not only as a Christian, but also as a gay man, acknowledging that this was a rare enough experience for most of us in the conventional church services. The exchange thus facilitated friendships and the sharing of ideas, including a letter sent by REACH to bishops and church leaders that was to be replicated by GCF. Gay Christian Fellowship also set up a small prayer group as a result of their trip to Dublin. Cooperation North also supported the well-established links between NGF and NIGRA. In July 1990, the latter welcomed the former to Belfast, where they received a report on police harassment of gay men and decided on greater northern involvement in the publication of Gay Community News, one of NGF's many publications. By September, Andrew Wakefield was appointed a northern editor of the magazine, which was already distributed in Derry through Book One Community Bookshop. In his report on Nigra's visit to Dublin that August, Wakefield acknowledged that this formalised input marked a shift, as links between the two groups before this had only been on a personal level. Nigra committed a minimum amount of copy, um, of, of monthly copy to gay community news, which Wakefield commended as according the organisation, a regular method of communicating with the gay and lesbian communities in NI in the Republic, resulting overall in a great pool of knowledge and experience to call on. This partnership was sufficiently productive and exceptional that NIGRA and NGF were awarded the Community Care Section in a project award scheme by Corporation North in 1991. Overall, these three decades of exchanges and friendship forged a cross-border LGBT community that was far from insular. Not only did this intimacy provide solidarity, advice and understanding that was lacking from wider society on both sides of the Irish border, but the closeness of LGBT groups across the island offered beneficial models for replication. We can see this in how Gay Christian Fellowship emulated Reach's prayer group, the establishment of the Carpenter Club in the 1980s, and of course, most pertinently, through the concurrent achievements of homosexual decriminalization. 
first in 1982 for Northern Ireland, and then for the Republic some 11 years later. These two communities were unequivocally integrated by their shared experiences, their partnership, and their accomplishments. Although the IQA sources I have consulted have enabled me to identify an island-wide LGBT activist movement that was coactive and synergetic, there are a number of gaps in this record that I would like to address in the remaining time. Firstly, these sources accent NGF over other gay organisations in the Republic, perhaps distorting our perception so that links between Belfast and Dublin appear the most developed and frequent. Though it is likely the case that the two capitals were the main sites of collaboration and friendship between LGBT activists in Ireland during this period, they certainly weren't the only ones. An emphasis on the relationship between NGF and NIGRA is also unsurprising, given the former's influence in the compilation of the Irish Square Archive. In a 1982 letter, Christopher Cathcart, Secretary Treasurer of Cara Friend, references an intended visit to Dublin, but lacks the affinity and warm comradeship of Dudgeon's correspondence with Keogh and Walsh contained in this repository. Um, and you probably can't read the handwriting that I've studied there, but the, one of the quotes says, if possible, we would like to meet a group from NGF sometime during that weekend to exchange ideas and generally discuss each other's work. A similar unfamiliarity is evident in a February 1984 letter from Joe McGuigan of Derry Car Friend to Eamon Gilmore of NGF, which tentatively requests a copy of NGF News. Th these handwritten letters also lack the habitual formality of the Nigra stationery used by Judgeon during this period, which you'll have been able to see in some of the other um, slides is quite distinctive. Further research is needed to assess how comparatively significant relations between Belfast and Dublin were by drawing out these wider networks of solidarity. Moreover, the available record in these sources is significantly dominated by men, replicating many of the historiographical deficiencies in Irish and Northern Irish LGBT history. Lesbian feminist Joni Crone, who famously came out on the Late Late Show in 1980 to encourage law reform in the Republic, has lamented that although participants in every liberation movement in Ireland, lesbian women have seldom been sung about, written about, or given any kind of prominence. The atypicality of female actors within the groups referenced in this paper was sufficient for Bernard Kyoto to remark that one of the organisers is a woman, happily, in a 1981 letter to Dudgeon concerning the Galway Gay Collective. This deficiency had the effect of restricting services that organisations like Cara Friend could provide to the LGBT community in Northern Ireland. A lack of female volunteers reduced and then ended the functioning of the Lesbian Line Service in 1981. This had provided women with an outlet to express their sexuality and form important support networks. One volunteer recalled the isolation of such women who had never told anyone about their feelings before me. These women led lonely, lonely lives and didn't even have the option of attending the gay discos out of fear that they'd be seen and they'd lose everything. Lesbian organization in Ireland broadly took place within the movement for women's rights. Irish Women United was established in 1975, campaigning on issues of equal pay, contraception, and violence against women. The IWU Charter set out an ambiguous demand for the right of all women to a self-determined sexuality, with implicit provision for lesbian and bisexual women. This organisation soon proved to replicate the marginalisation of le lesbian concerns within the gay rights movement, despite their enthusiastic contribution. These experiences of being sidelined within the LGBT movement and feminist organisations inspired some lesbian women to pursue an agenda that addressed their specific needs. The organisation of Irish lesbians began with Sappho and Belfast in 1974. This targeted approach relied heavily on cross-border collaboration. Lesbians Organising Together was formed in September 1991 as an umbrella organisation and in 2000 Lesbian Links another group of activists from Belfast, Derry and Dublin, launched a photographic visibility project as a touring exhibition. Lesbian line organisations across Ireland developed similar networks of connectivity, with groups at Belfast and Cork providing training and support to newer organisations. Helen Slatter of the Cork Lesbian Line referenced the great travelling done between cities. International Women's Day meant a trip to Belfast to their strip search protests. Then it was Cork for the fun weekend in May, and go away for the women's summer camp. Though there is some reference in the Irish Queer Archive, further research is needed to uncover how these gender-based cross-border links played out in practice, especially through the 1987-88 exchanges between lesbian lines under Cooperation North. 
The latter was a subsect of Car Friend from 1974 that gained autonomy in 1989 and was like Car Friend and NGF, recognized by Corporation North in their award ceremony in 1990. However, however, sorry, as Elspeth Fisher, one of the volunteers for LGBT History and I highlighted in a collaborative talk for Outing the Past in March, unlike their gay male equivalent, representatives from a lesbian line were sidelined in a private award lunch that silenced these women's achievements as they purported to celebrate them. Finally, the IQA records I've examined, similarly to Irish LGBT history more generally, significantly neglect trans experiences and activism, an effort that's been expanded by activists and historians, including Sarah Phillips, the, the Irish Trans Archive. I hope that this paper has gone some way to countering the idea that partition was a significant stumbling block to cooperation between LGBT activists in Ireland and Northern Ireland by demonstrating how the cultural similarities of these two contexts facilitated collaboration and friendship. In actively bridging divisions and creating a foundation for change, I don't think that the value of this alliance should be underestimated. More work remains to be done to assess how else the Northern Ireland movement interacted with organisations outside of its immediate domestic surroundings, but this shared heritage can help us better understand how and why change happened in the late 20th century. Though largely a record of official correspondence, the IQA has allowed me to trace these relationships and connections amidst discussion of campaigns, exchanges and publications. Perhaps the most identifiable, uh, identifiable expression of this is in the signing off of letters, and you can read some examples of this from the 1980s on the screen. These gradually became more informal and open and explicit in their identity, shifting from an uncertain yours faithfully to much gay love and love and struggle. Though they might have been 100 miles apart, such correspondence rhetorically and practically closed this territorial distance through cultural bonds and personal connections that forged community and facilitated change. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Abigail. And um, people are muted, so that's why you can't hear the applause. But um, I, that's to say, uh, you've gone through um, a lot of material there, which is great for our audience, but also because it's recorded, it would be a benefit to to other viewers later on. And um, it took us through uh, quite a bit of the um, Irish queer archive material, which pertains uh, uh, to cross border cooperation, which is great for those people who are not. Um, familiar with it. Um, I'm going to talk on for a minute to allow people who have questions to either post them into the chat and then I'll be able to see them and pass them on to Abigail or to gather your thoughts. So while I give you that that minute to um to, to get together your questions, um, just a few observations. One is there are a few people you mentioned who I know are in the audience, including um, Edmund Lynch, who was part of, of, of some of those cross-border exchanges. Um, also at the end, you mentioned about the um, Cooperation North um, Award to the Cork and Belfast Lesbian Lines. Um, the, the picture of, um, of the certificate, uh, the, our first prize given to the, the two lesbian groups um, um, is now in our new um, we opened um, LGBT History and I digital archive, which um, prior to you coming on tonight, um, we've posted onto our, our social media. So if people want to see um, the actual certificate and uh, they can have a look at it. Um, and as you said, um, some of our own project volunteers um, spoke about women's news, including um, uh, that cross-border cooperation um, um, in a recorded talk uh, last March. But um, your listeners, viewers may be interested to know that um, Although the lesbian groups were awarded first prize, um, Cooperation North was at the time embarrassed about letting the wider world know that the lesbians had been so successful at cross-border cooperation. So um, they um, basically um, muzzled the publicity about it. So that is indicative of how um, even a progressive organization called Cooperation North, which later became Cooperation Ireland, um, didn't have the confidence to celebrate cross community, cross border cooperation between um, um, lesbians. And of course, you also mentioned about um, um, there um, being some cross border um, activity um, uh, among the, the trans community. And for those who are interested in that, um, Sarah Phillips gave a talk on, on trans history in Ireland a few months ago. It's up on um, the YouTube channel of our, of our project on the 
uh, and um, you can refer back to that if you want any details. So I am going to look at the questions and if you want to say anything while I'm looking at the chat, please feel free, Abigail. Um, uh, right, there is a, a question here um, from Ian Miller, uh, who's a historian at University of Ulster Coleraine. He asks, was cross-cultural collaboration unique to LGBT activists in Ireland, or was it also common in other forms of activism? For example, I think he means cross-border collaboration. Was this also um, common in other forms of activism, such as disability rights, feminism, etc.? No, that's a brilliant question, um, Ian, and something that I think about a lot in, um, I, I seem to apply it to anything I study um, in terms of Irish activism. So um, it's a little bit off topic from what we were talking about this evening, but my um, master's work looked at the women's peace movement in Belfast. Um, and particularly within that looked at sort of how um, women in the North and South mobilized against um, the violence of the Troubles together. And um, that was written one year after I did this research. So it was very much in mind. And I, I think the similarities kind of come across. It's very interesting to see how, um, though we might think of activism in one country as being sort of a discrete phenomenon. And I, I really do think that the work that yourself, Richard, and, and, and all of the volunteers are doing to do with NI activism is really important to, to ground itself in those kind of cultural specificities of like what makes it um, Northern Irish. We do see this kind of coming across and particularly um, in issues that are sort of gender and sexuality based where they kind of have this common identity or these, these common factors that inhibit their lives and make them more difficult and um, that they do um, form other connections. But I'd be really interested to hear more about um, what you mentioned with, um, with disability rights. I know feminism, things like the contraception train, things like that were were very much an active part of um, sort of feminist activism in the late 20th century. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting phenomenon that plays out in different kinds of activism, um, not just LGBT activism. Thank you, Abigail. There's lots of questions here and I'll run through some of them. Um, there's um, actually one from David Terry McFarlane who asks, are you aware of the Inter-Insular Conference from 1984? I actually I did I cut the international conference um for time from the um uh, from the source but it is in those IQA files that I looked at on on Northern Ireland um so off the top of my head uh, just remember more that the the file for it was talking about Kinkora and things like that um that were around the time uh but if anyone was at it or knows any more about it I'd be very interested to hear. Uh, there's a question from Patrick McDonough um says to ask you, have you done any research on the Union of Sexual Freedoms in Ireland set up in February 1974? Now, I know you, you said that you started in 77 because that's what they are, the, um, the um, IQA material that you came across was available. So that was the first organization that sought to be a national organization encompassing all of Ireland, met a lot of resistance. Um, any comment on that? No, again, I've, I've, I've heard of it. I know a lot of Patrick's work kind of looks at those earlier, um, those earlier organisations that really do embrace this kind of all island perspective from the very beginning. Um, so it's not just something that starts in 77 with these sources I've looked at today. It, it really does go to the very beginnings of, of Irish LGBT activism on, on both sides of the border. Great. Um, I'll continue with um, some more of the questions in the chat and then, um, you know, we can turn to some members of the audience. Um, for this is from Cahal Kelly. Um, other possible connections that occur to me, one, on the international stage would be the archives of um, Irish lesbian and sorry, the International Lesbian and Gay Association. Um, their archives show evidence of organizations cooperating in that setting, something to look at. Um, secondly, um, at the end of your period, the EU peace program funded cross-border activities that activists in, in counties, sorry, this is a very small print in the chat, that activists in counties near the border were able to use. And thirdly, you've got a long list of, of points, it's great. Um, um, on the political sphere, the gay hiking group in Dublin was founded and did at some stage start exchange hikes with a Belfast group 
though I don't know if the shared hikes come after your period. There, there are actually um, some shared hikes um, um, in the current decade, but um, uh, he just mentioned that that would be another um, maybe area of cross border, you know, cooperation, which obviously is a, is a, is a, is a, is a leisure activity. Any comments on, on, on those points? Um, but thank you so much for this, Carl. I didn't know about the hikes, so that's very interesting. Um, uh, that sounds brilliant. I'd love to hear more on those. Um, and in terms of sort of the the ILGA and things like that, I did come across those sort of when I was reading more broadly on um, European-wide um, kind of connections and things like that. And I think there's a lot more to be done in terms of situating both both Irish movements within sort of what's happening in Europe and, and further afield. Um, certainly within my PhD is much very collaborative in terms of um, what I'm looking within the UK and Ireland framework, but I think this perspective is a really valuable one to kind of um, help us not situation situate an eye in a vacuum, but actually think about how many different links there were at the time. Um, so that's a really good. And again, I didn't hit, I didn't know about the EU peace program either. Um, so that's very helpful for my research. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. And actually, I can I can add to that from personal experience because in the late nineties my late partner Mervyn Kingston was attached to the outcomers group in Dundalk just south of the border and he suggested that they go north of the border and have some meetings in Newry and that actually kick-started the um the development of a of a Newry group um, um such that when they actually had a, a formal opening of a center there they recognized that it was actually some activists coming from across the border that had helped them inform the critical mass to start a group in, in Newry, um, north of the border. Um, some people thanking yeah, you. Richard. Sorry, go on, Carl. No, I, just, I think I could be wrong, but I think there were similar links between Derry and Letterkenny, um, again, under peace, but I, I may be wrong in that detail, and it may be after the period that-, that No, I, 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 think, I think you're right, and the, um, I mean, there would have been links which were not funded, but when funding became available, and certainly when I have engaged with, 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 with people in Derry, they talk about needing to consider, you know, Derry and Donegal as a, as a common area. I mean, particularly in, in that part of the border area, it's something to look at. Um, though, I mean, much of that money came after the period that, um, that, that uh, Abigail has specified in her talk. Um, there's a question here from an Ian. How far did the police in both sides of the border follow gay rights cross-border links and seek to disrupt them? It's a brilliant question for me. And um, I think it's very interesting that the I, I've sort of noticed the more I've revisited these letters, how much they don't tell us. Um, and was sort of receiving quite a, quite a nice record of attending each other's discos and things like that. So um, I mean, if any of you know from personal experience interactions with the police, I know the only sort of relevant to, um, relevant detail to that that I can think of from these particular letters are those kind of li particular lines that are about um, having to incentivize particularly the southern groups to travel north um, during during these acute periods of the troubles. Sort of um, going to Dublin seems to be quite a routine thing. But when they're um, trying to get them to come to Belfast, it's sort of, oh, you must come <laughs> and, that, um, and that sort of thing. Um, but I'd be very interested to see um, if the police interacted with that in any kind of more formal way and created a culture of fear sort of more particularly with these groups rather than just in the general sense of the conflict that was happening. Thanks. I think the, I, I think the truth is that the, the, there was really zero connection between the police forces on both sides of the border. You know, um, the Belfast police dealt with the pogrom in Northern Ireland and there may have been um, repression of gay rights in the Republic of Ireland, but they would have been separate completely, you know. Um, just there were no links between, insignificant links between the Guardi and the RUC there. That's very helpful, Brian, because basically the relations between the police forces at the time were bad, which was to the benefit of the LGBT community because they couldn't coordinate um, harassment. Um, the, um, I, mean, I, I should comment on that, that I am aware myself um, in the, you know, the 1990s of troubles period that um, um, people who identified uh, as gay were prepared to travel at some distance to go to sort of events. So for example, um, 
um, uh, people um, in Gaz and I were prepared to go to some events in 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 um, in Monaghan, and some people uh, inside were prepared to go to some events in in Enniskillen. So, um, Gaz were prepared to 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 brave the roads and the possible army checkpoints to get to their um, desired destination when there was a social event. Um, there's um, uh, a um, uh, quest. Well, say it's not a question is more comment from um, Jude says thank you very lovely talk said this isn't really about the border but he thinks he'd like people to know that he'd heard that Tom Robinson a very well known um, singer uh, um, in the previously 70s 80s donated some royalties of his 1978 hit glad to be gay to the Jeff Dudgeon legal decriminalization fund does anyone have any knowledge of that it is correct yes that, that is correct i can't remember the amounts involved but tom robinson was very helpful you know that is uh, useful see it's great to have someone like brian gilmer who remembers the period on the spot <laughs> to give us instant i mean where else are you going to get that in history that we get <laughs> instant comment um okay i've taken some questions from the chat and um I'm just going to turn now is if there's anyone who um, I I'm going to gallery view um, I'm going to go to gallery view who wants to speak out loud or raise your hand to ask a question please do I think Han's got a hand up Han do you want to say something Yeah hi um, Abigail thanks for the talk it was really interesting great paper um, I'm just curious. Uh, and kind of reflecting on the Jeff Dudgeon case versus the David Norris case, um, given that decriminalisation had already happened in the UK in the 60s and um, the, do you think, sorry, were there links with, with the UK that Northern Ireland perhaps benefited with from more than the Republic, um, you know, in kind of perpetuating decriminalisation, but also just generally um, like I, I know, I know, kind of Tony and some of the kind of activists in in the Republic talk about links with London, and certainly in publications receiving kind of publications through London and stuff. So I'm just wondering, in terms of the North, have you looked into that or? That's a brilliant point. Thank you. Um, so I'm very early in my research in terms of the, the long form stuff. I should preface this by saying I'm in the first year of my PhD. Um, so, but it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant observation. I think um, in terms of the UK, maybe giving NI a, a step up, I, I, I view the sort of pattern with it. It's a very interesting leapfrogging kind of scenario where they're both from the same starting point then I, and I get decriminalization before the Republic, but then in terms of the 21st century, it's kind of reversed. But you see the two fates are constantly intertwined, sort of whenever anything happened more recently in terms of the Republic, everyone looks to the North and goes, you're next. Um, so in terms of the UK actually um, benefiting them there, I think that's a really interesting point. Uh, both of them do go to Europe and it is ultimately Europe that, um, guarantees that legal change. So the UK government did try on occasion um, in the 1970s to pass up certain orders um, to extend the, the legislation that was in England and Wales um, to Northern Ireland, but it was always um, forces within Northern Ireland that were blocking that. Um, so it eventually then becomes a debate that Europe makes the decision and the UK has to act on that, but actually it's, it's NI that's very resistant to it. Um, so I certainly do think that the UK there is a mechanism is you, you know um, it pushes pushes that further along perhaps than was the case in the republic because it was another force for, for for legal change. But I'd have to do more research into the, what happened um, in the nineties to kind of think more about whether that was totally absent in in the case of the republic. Because obviously by that point, much more, many more countries in the European Community had also um, been kind of mandated to to Im implement decriminalisation. Um, I'm forgetting your second point now. I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, it was kind of it, it fe feeding into that. Really. Well, I, I was talking about kind of, you know, in the South that, that certainly Tony would talk about kind of getting publications through and, and also some of the women's groups in in the Republic talk about kind of access to to kind of feminist publications through 
through through London, sorry, London primarily, but through the UK. No. And that, that's a, that's another point and something that I'm really interested in my PhD, sort of looking at how the UK was used um, as this kind of, at the same way that perhaps in some of these um, instances that we've looked at today, that, and I looked at maybe the Republic's discos and said, oh, we'd like to, we'd like to replicate that. Um, and the same way that sort of somewhere like London was seen, seen as this real um, ad advanced capital um, for, for gay people. And equally, I think there's some really interesting research being done by, I, I know Daryl Lee, whether he's doing some work on the kind of di the diaspora and people who left Ireland and went to London. And particularly within these letters, I know it was sort of referenced um, when they were talking about the Galway Gay Collective that John Porter went away to London and it was almost that he kind of had his his um, gay education in, in London amongst the activist community there and then brought it back to Galway. So I'd be really interested to trace um, to trace more of those li links and see how, how else that plays out. Thanks. Right, anyone else have a question that they'd like to um, shout out or, um, uh, uh, or wave madly, but remember that I'm, I'm, I'm working on two screens, so shouting out is probably easier. Um, Just to build on the point about London as a source of help, I, a, a useful starting point might actually be the bookshop gave the word. I hearing, remember hearing some years ago somebody there saying that a huge amount at one stage of their sales was by post to people outside the UK who couldn't get access to material. Now, I don't know what records they've kept, um, but they maybe were talking to, to see if, if they have anything that would give evidence for or against your No, that's a, 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 a good point. I mean, if you think about it, there were very few places in Ireland, North and South, where publications were available. I mean, you would have had, um, um, you know, books upstairs would have had a small stock or um, just books in Belfast or bookworm in, 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 in Derry. But, um, my understanding is that that people were getting material, um, you know, by post in case the word would be would be an obvious um, uh, source of that. Um, any other um, one, one wants to? Um, uh, Richard, can please? I come in there, Richard, a moment? Yes, please, Sarah. Uh, hi, Abigail. Thank you so much for that. It was really interesting to to listen to. Um, just a just a piece of information, I suppose. There were, in relation to trans history here, there were uh, very early on some connections between the Belfast Butterfly Club and Friends of Ian in the late 70s, mainly out of the fact that a lot of them had met with each other in the Beaumont Society in London. Um, but what, as the kind of Friends of Ian especially start to separate, what actually is interesting is this, uh, and again, I hate using these, this language, but transsexuals within those groups start to share information about how to get hormones, how to get surgeries, how to get medical treatment. And, and there's quite an interesting kind of, as they separate out into kind of two distinct groups um, from both those who identify as transvestite and those who identify as transsexual, that actually there's more of a connection going into the eighties of information sharing as much as there is a social, the social side of it tends to end up mostly with uh, the transvestite side of the community. Um, and that continues on into the 90s, um, where you see quite a lot of uh, social events happening in Dublin, where the Belfast Butterfly Club come to Dublin quite regularly for social events. So it's just a tuppence worth, there was no question as such. Thank you very much for that, it's really helpful <laughs> for scribbling. <laughs> Yes, thanks, Sarah, because uh, especially we find with the question section of these meetings, it's just an, an opportunity for just sh sharing knowledge and and, 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 and information. So, um, but um, I re I'd refer you back again to Sarah's talk, which is up, up, up online for some more details of, of, um, on, the, on those points. Um, anyone else um, want to... Uh, uh, Shout out. Okay, um, I'll, we'll, I'll come back again to see if, if anyone else has a question, but I'm going to make an announcement, a really exciting announcement. Um, um, first is um, 
we so i'm just going to go to the chat for the information um we have in the audience um uh jude copeland who is um was spearheading the campaign to have a plaque in Port Rush uh, to recognize Mark Ashton. And, and Mark Ashton is a very significant uh, Irish um, rare um, gay activist um, who um, many of you may know, um, you know, went to uh, London, was um, involved in left-wing politics, but also, um, and was openly gay, uh, but um, was co-founder of Lesbians and Gay Support the Minors, uh, which um, some of you may be familiar with the film Pride, which was which was made uh, um, um, about um, the relationship between the um, lesbian and, and gays in, in in London and and, and the striking minors, particularly in in, in Wales. Um, so Mar uh, Jude is also a volunteer with our, with our project, but um, Jude has just sent me a message, which is that um, the local council in the Port Wash area, Causeway Coast and Glens, um, one of their committees was meeting tonight. And uh, we are pleased and relieved to say that the committee um, passed by a majority vote to um, proceed to full council. Um, uh, with a recommendation um, that a plaque would be erected um, to, to Mark Ashton. So uh, that's um, very encouraging uh, news. And thank you, Jude, for your efforts, which leads me to my next announcement, which is next month's LGBT History Club is not going to be on a Tuesday. It's going to be on a Wednesday. And it's going to be on Wednesday, the 19th of May. And the reason it's going to be on the 19th of May is because we're going to have a birthday party. And the birthday party is going to be for... Mark Ashton, because 19th of May is Mark Ashton's birthday. And we're going to declare the LGB History Club of next month on Wednesday, the 19th of May, 8 p.m., to which you're all invited, remembering Mark Ashton. And it's a birthday tribute with um, Mike Jackson from Lesbians and Gay Support the Minors, Sheehan James, um, it's a character you may recognize from, from the film Pride uh, of the um, Miners support group in Wales. Uh, we'll have other guests um, who um, uh, uh, knew Mark, and um, I know that uh, Jude is 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 planning other um, birthday celebrations. So um, if you'd like to come back um, for um, on the birthday party for Mark Ashton, which of course we hope will increase our knowledge. Of, of Mark Ashton and increase awareness of him, particularly um, here in Northern Ireland. Um, uh, I'll be posting this on our project social media tomorrow and uh, Jude will be, be circulating it on, on, on his. And um, um, because I'm actually stepping down from, from, the, from the, the Heritage Project, the contact email won't be the usual one. It'll be um, cara.mccann at hereni.org. But um, uh, we have a whole month before um, uh, that happens. So that is next month's LGBT History Club. Um, any um, final uh, questions? Um, so yes, uh, some more um, thanks to our speakers and to, to, to Jude. Any uh, final, um, oh yeah, I'll knock off the, I'll knock off the record. Um, if we can just find the thing. Um, Sorry here. This is the thing about uh, I'm not sure whether it's such a good idea to come into the um into the 